Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Haver, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. Well, well, well. What Hello, do we have Evan. here? Another launch code. Holy shit. I could not be happier today uh, to introduce one of the finest men I know. The man, the myth, Dave Rut Rutherford. What else can I say? I don't know. What Fuck, else man. is there? I, I want to I wanna do some like... Big booming fucking the bum, man, bum, the, bum, myth, bum, 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 the legend. That's right. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, I'm blowing the mic dude, out. He's like, God, I hate out. this guy. Blowing already. it out. Fuck. I can't right. scrub that. My dude, do you know how much I love you? How much? Like, there's a spectrum of love one man can give to another. There really is. But most of the time, it's real small because everybody gets a little yeah. homophobic and yeah, they don't want to rub up. You know? They're super. like, ooh, okay, I'll give you a little pat love, a little right. bad that. But, dude, I'm full bone, mm -hmm. dude. I'd kiss you on the lips, bro. I'd squeeze your buns. Man, I'd <laughs> name my child after you. That's you how much I love you. You got to have a boy. You got to have a boy first. Bro, I'm... Right. I, I just told you what's fixing to happen right God, four. God, four, four daughters. Four girls. Four daughters. Well, yeah. holy crap, man. This has been a long time coming. Thank you. Know, you it has been a long so time coming. We have we've been talking about this for like two years. I was on your podcast, uh, well, you and Marcus. Dude, last year. I was just telling Dave how you were on with my first podcast, that's Navy right. Seal Shit. Radio yeah, that's right. in two thousand thirteen. 14, bro. That's right. 13 or 14? 14. 14. Because I did my very, I, I was like, dude, there are so many guys killing it in the entrepreneur world. Let's do a show about veteranpreneurs. And, it. and you were the first one by far that popped in my head. That's right. That's when uh, I was trying to start that crowdfunding site. Yeah, Twist Rate, yeah, man. Twist Rate. God, it was Dirt brilliant. Napped. Dirt napped it. No, dude, come yeah. on, man. You did good. great. Think I about what you learned about investing about oh God. finance about all that stuff when you because dude i was oblivious and still am quite frankly but you were like bro and then you do this and you got your tranche and you got just series a and you got and i'm like oh <laughs> dude that was such a um we tried you know and it's so funny because I, I was I was into it i was really really fucking into it you were and uh you're passionate bro god i i and that that's just a testament to the fact with partners like that and i think i've talked about it a little bit like partners were so important to that my partners in that jeff was awesome jeff mm -hmm. kirkham's awesome yep. but we had another set of partners that we, it, it's not that they were bad dudes whatsoever it's like it's like a marriage where and i've i've explained this to people so many times where you go into partnerships and you go into marriages a lot where two people might not work out that doesn't mean one of those two people or both those two people aren't good people. They're just not good together. And As a man who just got divorced, I can tell you, and a man who's also messed up with partners in the past as well, too, I can tell you it's, it's a lot like that. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared for that. I think so often people don't do that, right? Dude! We're going to be the best ever. You're the coolest dude. I'm the coolest guy. Fuck, we can do anything we want, man. It'll always be perfect. But you know what? Let's take a good year to figure out this uh, operating agreement. Yeah. And let's really get to know each other on a business level. And yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go through a bunch of confidence targets together and see if we really actually like clearing houses together. Because it's like, I learned that about dudes before I went to war with them, too. Like, like I... Guys I thought were fucking stellar, awesome guys. And then you go to war, and then you're like, that dude's a fucking turd. And But that the funny thing is, is like, everybody has their own perspective. And I'm sure if they were like, if we were to reverse and ask them, they'd be like, oh, I fucking hate that guy. Right? <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm like, everybody says to my face, oh, Rod's the most motivating guy on the planet. But behind, they're like, what a shitbag that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, I'm sure that's what they say about me. So, it's like, oh, God. So let me ask you guys a question. So you guys are catching up. Um, and I was here with Dave. Uh, Dave, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was here with Dave an hour before you got here. You guys go way back, it sounds like. 
Yeah, we go way back. Okay. Like when? It, what year was that? It was, that, was 2010. Yeah, that's it right. was it was January 20 something 2010. Yeah. It was right after the coast bombing. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Eight uh, uh, CIA mm -hmm. uh, people were blown up by a triple agent. Yep. Uh, and the the person that was the base chief of that i had actually mm -hmm. just put through training not shortly before that so that was a pretty tough day for me personally right uh hit the ground uh in in uh Kabul, and the first person I, this is my very first like downrange trip with the agency right very first one first person i meet i get off there's evan sitting there with me <laughs> And and I know I knew V from back in the yeah. teams, but you, yeah. and it was just like I heard you talk, and I was like, "Wait, is he is he allowed to be that sarcastic?" <laughs> <laughs> and then you did it to everybody. everybody. It wasn't yeah. just like the the flight guys or like kind of the support dudes. Then like we're around like important people, and you're same just dishing it to them. I'm like. What the fuck, dude? What's going on, dude? He's gonna be on that bird out of here. Yeah, First one they think, flying. Yeah. And I remember we, me and Kate's, we stayed in your room. Yep. For five days. Yeah. And it was the five most informative days I had in my entire time working for the Central Intelligence. Are you serious? Hands down. Holy shit. Yep. And because all, all we did was just fuck off too. Like all we were doing was like we, laughing and telling stories. Dude, and but it was, it was super fun. When you say informative, like I mean about like war and stuff, or like other things, like how to build an axe, or like what <laughs> level of informative, like. <laughs> oh, do we do we start going? Have I? Like you, have I? Right, I like that. I love those. By the way, I've I've done a couple of Jewish Christian weddings together where I was a so minister. Good. It was awesome. Um, and the dance thing with the chair. God, wow, I love the that. Dance. Yeah, the chair. The, yeah. What is that called? I don't know, but it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And tell like, like Uncle Seymour is so annihilated, like he drops the thing and the, the bride tips over and smashes her head and then you got to run up because you're a medic and try, but try that's to all in those put her head back together. <laughs> it was informative because Evan has a perspective that he figures things out really quickly. And I'm going to talk about you like yeah, I'm talking fine. through you, yeah. if you don't mind. And, but he does so in, you know, when he comes across, obviously there's a, a, a deep level of sarcasm. But once you understand what he's getting at and once he starts talking from his gut and from his heart and from his head, which is amazing because a lot of people can't fuse those together, the, the, la the quality of information. And for me it was, hey, listen, this is your first trip. You know, this is what you need to expect. This is what you got to think about. This is what you got to do. These are where your support here. This is other. This is how you need to start to act towards the case officers you're working with. This is, you know, and because, you know, teaching them on a flat range how to shoot, move, communicate and do T triple C and some other things is one thing. But to be working with them in a high stress environment was a totally different thing. And if you haven't figured out, I'm, I can get a little high spun sometimes. And so. A lot of people that are rubbed the wrong way, in particular people that work, they're super secret squirrels and they don't like that. Right. So he was like, bro, love your energy, love this, but maybe down here. <laughs> Pull it on back down here. <laughs> and, and then, but once we were through that, because that took what, about six minutes, seven yeah, minutes? Six, seven minutes. <laughs> then it was his ideas. Because my big thing that I always asked everybody was, what's your... What's your exit strategy? Right. What's, what's your plan? Yeah. What are you going to do? And he was the first dude that ever, and, and I had contracted years before with Blackwater when I first got out of the teams in 03, and I worked for Blackwater 04, 05, 06. And I'd always say, what's your, what's your plan? And oh, I'm, I'm going to start a bar. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get a bar or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, crazy wazoo, boring shit. He was like, no, man, I'm going to start this business and this business, and I got an ID for this business. And he, he like was like free-firing 50-cal business ideas at me, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm a little inquisitive, so I'm like, well, how are you going to do that? And, how you, and he had thought about them all, and I was like, fuck, I like this, dude. And that was it. That was it. <clears throat> yeah, that was it. Like I, re I remember so so well that, that room in Kabul because dudes were coming through, quite a bit and and you know 
you either mesh with people or you don't. It's it's just a super easy thing. Like most of the guys are awesome. They're stellar people, but like rut comes through and you're like, man, that guy's fucking awesome. Like you're That's so cool. Thanks, motivating, <laughs> like coming through and he's just like injects you with positive energy. Just like here, here's your dose of rud. Just <laughs> <laughs> there you go, buddy. And I, I, uh, I just, for me and everybody asks, you know, are you always like this? Are you, do you ever come down and, and hell yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I can be a prick like the best of them, but I spent so much time in that mental space, that emotional space as a result of the cultural conditioning from the teams, you know, like I walked in and you're like, dude, you you were in the teams, you know, you know, and it was the hair, man. Yes. Yeah, the the, the long, beautiful locks. Yeah, man. Yeah. Beautiful. I spent a lot of time on it, you know, and, and I was so freaking negative as a default mechanism mm -hmm. for, to prepare myself for that constant peer evaluation that, is re I believe requirement of whatever unit you're with mm -hmm. that I became that guy. I was a jerk and I was always hammering and it wasn't like doing it for fun. Sarcastic. I was like, I got off on that stuff with people and, you know, getting out early and feeling like I missed everything. And I had some survivor's guilt with dudes and all this. I, when I finally got the opportunity to go back, I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. And I want to be the person that, when I walk in the room, people aren't going to be like, oh, shit, the fucking Rut's here. You know, like, oh, dude, Rut's here. Sweet. Yeah. Even if it sucks, we're still going to have a smile on our face and we're going to have a good time. So No, that's interesting that you say that. So, like, when I started working with Black Rifle and stuff, like, you know, I looked at Evan and Matt and Logan and, like, what their skill set was and what they were good at. And it's like, all right, how can I add value to this team and this organization to where I am valuable? So they got this covered, they got this covered, they got this covered. Okay, where are, well, I guess the term you guys would use, targets of opportunity. So like mm -hmm. I thought, all right, well, Twitter's not being utilized. Maybe I can get that ramped up and going. Or some other avenue, and it's like always trying to add value and be a positive where people want you around. Hands because, down. you know, there's a saying like, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's not actually not the only answer. Sometimes the squeaky wheel gets replaced. For sure. You know, right. and most people don't realize that. And I think it, that comes with maturity, which it, and I like you're saying, I used to be a raging asshole to people and I'm polarizing. People love me. They hate me. But very, it's like, yeah, very. <laughs> I, I, I'm fine with that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm struggling at <laughs> Are you, I'm struggling. Are I mean, struggling? I want to love them, but yeah. I, I'm and I love You're, everybody. Yeah, yeah, but it's I'm black white. Like, it's I'm super, trying, man. Yeah, and one day it can be black and one day it can be white. But yeah, you can, you can rotate. <laughs> you can rotate. You can, but no, it's it's interesting you say that because well, you know, think like, about personnel. Accepted, yeah, think about personnel, right? And for us, it was this wild experiment. You had guys from all these different units and all these different mindset, and you, all of a sudden now you're forced into you know, an environment that is a little challenging. And so what do you do? You either stand your ground and you say, nope, this is my past experience is relevant across all planes of current challenges. And you guys, you, you know, you're not going to bend or conform or you come in and you have a little humility and you listen to what people are having to say and you say, yeah, okay. And when the opportunity presents itself, after you've worked your ass off to kind of earn your place at the table, then then the people that are in charge, whatever that natural hierarchy or the imposed hierarchy, they'll start looking over and say, what do you think? And that gives you your opportunity, right. you know? But so, people don't know that that much. Let me ask you this. Like, what's, so working for the agency in whatever organization or capacity that is, he just made a good point. Like, what's it like with you know, like SEALs showing up to join the team or Green Berets or Rangers or guys from different branches. Like, dude, I, is I, there, is there like, a, a, I, like an exponential a competitiveness can, or something? Or? No, no, I'll, I'll go off on that for a while. Please, dude, is, you, you have like, a great is, perspective. This on is it. so, it was so fucking cool. And it was like really eye opening because you come from one unit, you know, one specific military branch, and you think your shit is like, it doesn't stink and we're better than everybody else. And then you get you get downrange and you, you get thrown into this melting pot of guys from each one of these, each one of these branches. And it took me- And different skill levels yeah, different, and experience yeah. levels. You'd have a guys from Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 and Rangers and cops and like, it's just like, it was just like wild, man. <laughs> and and it was so cool because 
it taught you it wasn't about the branch or the or 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 the background. It was always about the dude. Hands down. Always. Yep. And it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if the dude had a long tab or a trident or if he was a SWAT cop. It was like that guy's fucking solid. Yep. And you didn't care. You didn't care. Like, oh, that guy was a team guy. That 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 lasted like five fucking minutes. Really? Yeah, because I, I mean, once you'd been there for a while, like nobody fucking knew and nobody cared. It was nobody like, cared. I, 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 yeah. I don't know. Yeah, everybody knows Rut was so, a so team let, guy. So let's let's parallel that over to this podcast being entrepreneurial based. For those people listening, what does that sound like to you? Sounds like a job interview to me and a resume. No one gives a shit about your resume. What they care about is when they interview you and how you sell yourself during an interview. Kind of, which is you have to have a basic prerequisite in order to get your foot into the door. Like you're obviously not going to, you're not going to bring somebody on the team that can't shoot, that doesn't have a comprehend, a, 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 a comprehension of tactics because there has to be some type of level set playing field where everybody at least knows yeah yeah like trust like i'm not line of trust i'm not gonna get and i've done this where where i i would i and when i was really early on when i was doing some doing random shit wherever you'd be looking you'd be looking at part you know looking at a dude going who where did you come from oh and then the guy would say oh i was i was this and you're like oh fuck (laughs) Oh fuck! Okay, I was and then a police officer mm, in Atlanta. What? Wait, what? what? Yeah, dude. Do you, what, do you know what I had means? Uh, <laughs> yeah. What? I'm not. Yeah, but aren't aren't cops really good drivers though? <laughs> they are, right? Nah, it I... depends. I, but the funny <laughs> the funny thing is, is like, but that that was a question early on, and then you get to know guys and you work with them for several years, and you're like, oh, okay, well. Fuck, I, I don't even know what that guy did after a while. You're like, oh, yeah, f- what? You did that too? Holy shit, I didn't know that. But it's always the prerequisite when you're early on. You're like, what did you do? And then when you're later on, you're like, hmm. You know, because you would have you would have wide varieties of background, and then you'd always have to watch a few of the guys because you're like, okay, well, this dude doesn't even know. He doesn't know what it's... <laughs> He's never even seen the elephant, you know. Like he doesn't, he doesn't know what things are like when it when things get fucking loud, and so and that's a whole. There's a there's an in, there's an infinite jump in a person's perspective, especially in a, in a, in a combat scenario prior to an an actual you know, however a gunfight or any type of you know an, a complex attack or whatever it might be. There's this massive learning that takes place within seconds that you're like, okay, well, fuck, I know at least what I'm dealing with with this this guy because he hasn't been there. So I'm going to have to really fucking watch him. And not only that, like I'm more, more importantly, I'm going to have to speed him up because this shit happens fast. So you're going to have to, and I remember it because the the CIA guys that we did the, the invasion with, the ground branch guys, like they were just like fucking cool as cucumbers, dude, man. They were just man. like ice, ice men. Yeah, yeah. Like dudes wearing cowboy boots and fucking <laughs> jeans with a fucking mag in his back pocket, just like, don't worry, I got this fucking knife. I'll be all right. I'm like <laughs> dude, what? Crazy. Yeah, crazy. crazy. And you're like, dude, I got like fifty oh, magazines oh. and fucking frags and everything oh, else, and. Bro. <laughs> You're like, how the fuck am I going to get to this dude's level? And this guy's dangerous, you know? And I think I remember, like, the last thing I did in in, uh, in Kabul. I was like, just, I shoved a fucking mag in the back of my pocket and fucking put a pistol, you know, tucked it into my fucking waistband. I love like, Mel Gibson. Let's just fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> get in the fucking car, rookie. Let's go. <laughs> I love it, dude. But it's about the common language, right? When is everybody able to speak the common tongue, right? Initially, in any job or place you come, it's babble to everybody, Yeah. right? Everybody's got, you know, your tones are different, you know, the language is different, and then in a short period of time, you either lead, learn to speak the language and be able to be proficient with the knowledge base, or, man, it's apparent in and our, the peer evaluation, that's the one beautiful aspect about that type of job and that living, peer evaluation is, is instantaneous and yeah. can happen very quickly. Yeah. In the civilian world, it takes a much longer period of time to teach everybody to, to speak and a much longer period of time to get rid of those bad apples. Right. So were there yeah. guys that came in that like were totally motivated to learn as quickly as possible? And then at the same time, were there guys that like just – 
weren't motivated to learn stuff or thought they knew everything or whatever. Oh, there's For sure. Tons of those personalities. Yeah. Like, All the SEALs. <laughs> yeah. I think I, and it's funny because, and I'm not saying this because Dave's here, like SEALs sometimes take it on the chin, but they, they don't. It's just a matter of, I think it's one of those things where they're not taking it on the chin. They're just like, all right, team guys, you know, cause it, because of the books and because of a lot of the, the stuff that's come out, but it's like, man, like I said before, whether you're a force recon guy or green beret or a fucking ranger or a seal, it didn't matter, matter at all. It did not matter. Mm -hmm. You would see the most squared away, like AJ squared away fucking team guy from, you know, seal team four. And then right next to him, you would see a guy from seal team six and you're like, Oh man, this serious? Is, like really? You were yeah. you were there? Yeah. Same thing with with like Delta. I remember putting a guy through a uh, selection, and uh, my buddy from from Delta was like, "There's no way, no Delta guy can fail your course." And I was like, "Okay, okay." And I'm not shitting you. Probably two weeks later, this dude came through, and I I picked up the phone and I called him. I was like, "Hey, uh, Chris, do you know?" Uh, and I said his name. Yeah. He's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> everybody uh, has. Everybody. Everybody Doesn't has it's, their it's bottom 10%. So yeah. it's like he knows Todd as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Todd sitting there like Buds is not uh, Buds is about to start. And he's sitting there in a the room and he sees like all these like body of Adonis dudes walking. He's like, man, there's no goddamn way I'm going to make this. There's no way in hell. And then he said this one kind of pudgy dude walked in. He's like, man, is that guy a seal or something? They're like, oh, yeah, he's a seal. Todd goes, oh, I'm in. I got this. I shit. got this. He goes, if that motherfucker can pass Buds, there's no way in hell I won't pass Buds. Yeah. Well, there's a great story that, um, you know, I, I just I, I love listening to you know i'm a big fan jocko podcast oh, who is so it good. right and so good and and he, he had mike sorelli on and mike sorelli is one of the most incredible human beings you know and i don't know him but everything i've heard from guys that have worked with him he was on the roof with mike Mansoor. he was at gold team when extortion 17 he's got a master's at you know university of texas and right. business and you know, research. I mean, guys off the charts, former recon Marine enlisted, became an officer. I mean, he's, he's a special person. And, you know, he, they talk about, he and Jocko started talking about Ryan Job, who we lost, you know, the guy with the eye who died and, and, and they were in buds together. And, and like, he was like, he actually came over from recon and he went and he had words with him and he was like, Hey man, you know, you might want to think about quitting, you know? And, and he took, if you were a little pudgy in buds whatsoever, you, you were the lightning rod and they, a good buddy of mine, Hank got like, he was little, you know, he's an E5. So he's older. He's a SAR swimmer. He's been in the Navy and he's a little pudgy and he was the senior corpsman too. But so every day he had to do, he got hammered extra for not only being the senior corpsman, but also being not in right. the ideal shape. Robust. And it made him harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. Just like they said with Ryan, you couldn't. And then, you know, after they graduated, he went up to him and said, hey, man, I'm really sorry I said that to you. And and, it, and for me, it, it, it always goes back to, I, I, I walk into a room and, and, and have, really worked hard to recondition myself and particular what I do for a living now, which is work with companies and work with sports teams and all this. And, and as a, as a motivational coach and I force myself to say, everybody's even, right? I don't give a shit, right? I don't care who in the room is different. I, I'm not going to pass judgment by the way you look, by the way you sound, by what I think I know of you everybody's on the same playing field until I can start asking questions and hearing the way people speak and what their knowledge base is. And then you see how they act. And, and, and that's, man, that's part of, you know, running a business and, and recruiting and picking good people is, you know, having that intuition, but also, you know, knowing that person that's going to be patient to where they learn that common language. Yeah, it's funny. So going back to 2010, so <laughs> get, remember get, you, dude, you're like, you're like, all right, dude, you're going there. Holy shit. Have fun. Yeah. Some shit had just happened there. We went out and you're like, ah, ha, ha, you know, have fun <laughs> yeah. out there. And then, dude, we called back. We're like, we need more dudes. <laughs> and you and, and 
the other guy was in charge came down and you're like holy shit <laughs> dude <laughs> oh, I have no God. idea what y'all are talking yeah. about, but I like yeah. to imagine in my head, and it sounds like fun. Now we, we like so. Dave and I were talking. This was 2010, and you're you had Frog Logic at that. Point. Yes, I yeah. I started Frog Logic in 2006. Um, I uh, my second uh, trip to Afghanistan, first uh, second trip with Blackwater. I was doing a, a running a building project, building uh, the. Afghan border police training facilities in Gardez and Herat. And so right. I designed the bar. I was helping design the barracks, actually the senior seal really designed this great design, but I had drawn out the stuff for the ranges and where to set every training stuff. And cause I had just finished doing that in Azerbaijan and like the day before I left, they're like, right, you like doing this shit. Here's another job for you. You know? And I was like, right. yeah, yeah, I'll take it on the chin and they'll build the U S government for three jobs I was doing and only pay me for one. Right. Right. Um, so I'm doing that and, uh, you know, but I'm also doing the counter drug stuff and, and I was training them and then we're doing mentoring. So we did this sit up North and, you know, typically you walk into a compound, what's everywhere? Kids. I mean, yeah. they're kids. Oh, yeah. It's the yeah. number one challenge you yeah. have, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is kids, right? Because there's so many kids and they're all freaked out. Well, not really. When I mean, you say they, walk into a compound, you mean like doing the dirty business? Yeah, yeah. Or just yeah. like visiting? Just, no, you're... You're not yeah, visiting. No, we like were, You could say we're busy. We were... We were doing, doing your job. We were doing yeah, our okay, job. Right. And, and, you know, my first trip, it was right after, you know, not even a year after 9-11. After and I thought that I needed to cultivate hatred in order to do my job efficiently. And one of the big things that allowed me to uh, propel that myth or that falsehood, which really had a detrimental effect on me long term, was a, a, an ODA team was doing, was out driving around eastern uh, Afghanistan and as they would stop, and hearts and minds stuff, the best people in the world doing it. Lead vehicle, I brought some kids over to hand out Skittles or whatever. Right. 13-year-old kid comes up, boom, grenade in the front seat, blows the dude up. And so, you know, we're driving around in these DPVs, you know, we're out. What's no, a DPV? Desert Patrol Vehicle. Okay. Um, and so I got so bad, hated everybody so bad, like I'd rig up a pistol on my steering thing. And the kids, you know, if they didn't like it, they'd start chucking rocks at us coming through. So I'm drawing down on kids, ready to shoot kids in the forehead because I allowed that to be right. Well, next next level, I'm in this compound and for the first time, you know, I caught one of my big God moments, like God kind of touched me on the shoulder and said, Hey, look at these children though. Really look. And it, I, you know, Afghan kids, right? 13 year old girls, receptacles for procreation, beaten, whipped, hammered, little boys, raped, beaten, whipped, no school, no education, iron fists, you know, 14th century shit. Yeah. And that, that is not cool and so I, for the first time i saw that and i was like shit i want to do something to help that you know i need to, i don't want to carry my gun forever i want to do something that that's going to give me that self-actualization that's going to give me that you know that that altruistic purpose that's what it is but i initially thought because of my medic stuff that i could work with doctors without borders or usaid and you know just not culturally doesn't work so came back off that deployment, kept the research, and just began to discover that the kids in America were really starting to flounder. And so that spring, I wrote my first book, my first Frog Logic Concepts book, which was a kid's book on developing self-confidence for ages 8 to 13, because I believe that's the pivotal shit for kids. And that's when Frog Logic was born, was in that moment. And man, did I not know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so what is Frog Logic? Frog Logic Concepts is a motivational training and coaching company as, as well as a distribution of content too, right? And my idea is basically there are four main components that the human condition needs to address on a regular reoccurring basis. One, we have to understand our fear, uh, learn to embrace it, and utilize it as a propellant instead of that 
that paralysis that typically grasps people because right. we don't spend, I mean, how many fear classes have you taken in your career? How many times have you really sat down and thought about everything you're afraid of, written it out, adjusted it, done all this? Nobody. I give an embrace fear speech in front of a thousand people. I ask that question. Two people raise their hand. One person had to do it in a, you know, in a psych 101 course in college and the other one, their shrink made them do it because, right. you know, they're, they can't leave their house. But most people don't address it. So, you know, I, I believe people have to embrace fear. Two, self-confidence. Every day our self-confidence, Evan, you know this more than anybody else on the planet, man. You come into work, you're taking these massive risks with all these people's lives that are depending on you. You're making this decision. Man, that jars a person's self-confidence, but he has the tools that he can rely on that get him back in the fight every day after being knocked down. Self-confidence, critical. Third one is the team orientation, right? So much of our society is is breaking that down now and in the individualistic uh, i got mine mentality right. is 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 pervasive especially with and, and i'm a big fan of social media and its positive aspects but man it's it's really a detriment socially when you look at hey look at me give me a like make me feel verified right right you know? so the, I call it the team life. So I, I help people understand what it actually takes to put the team ahead of self. And then the final one, which I believe is the biggest one of all, you know, because the ultimate questions you need to ask is why am I here and what is my purpose is how to live with purpose, how to actually start that train moving towards something that you can say, hey, this is my purpose in life right now. And I feel pretty good waking up every day. That's really interesting. Um Three and four, I totally understand that. The first one, like writing down your fears, I've never heard of that. I've never even thought about that. Right. And the thought of actually sitting down and I started thinking like I'm terrified of horses. You know, <laughs> like, I'm serious. Yeah. But it's like, shit, man, I've never thought about that. And then the, the confidence thing, um, I, would, I would describe myself as overly confident. Like mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything in this world that I can't do. Cool. Um, how do you create self-confidence like how, how, how that's fascinating how the hell do you do that well i'll i'll take one and then you, yeah you can do the you can layer it in with actual professional uh professional <laughs> words dude you're uh, a professional at this stuff really. you know the funny thing is man it's like conquering fear and self-confidence they're actually in my mind they're they're tandem so they, yes. they work in tandem exactly and you have to when when you lay out your list and then in my life, I've laid out the list, but then anytime fear starts to come up, you have to conquer it. You have to smash it in order and not bury it. You have to defeat it and, and or start to develop the, the, uh, the tactics in order to defeat fear itself. Cut the head off of it, right? Well, well, well for the moment. For the moment. Right? For that, that sp the specificity of that existence, that fear that comes in at that moment the true nature of that specific fear, because fear is always going to come back. So like thoroughly yeah. define the fear and understand it from start to finish. Right? Well, you might not. Well, that, and that's, and that's, that's, the, that's the problem that's the is that it's so fucking complex. And, you know, when you have a lifetime of conquering fear and, you know, it's repetition, you have to get in and continue to dig and dig and dig and dig at it. You know, I built a life around going out and seeking challenges and in order to overcome fear so I could deal with it. So there's, there are aspects of this where you could say, I am a professional at conquering fear. Hands um, down. And when you're, I remember really early and I had this conversation with one of my first instructors in the, uh, special forces qualification course. Uh, his name was, uh, Jay Stubbs, uh, fuck, uh, incredible guy in, uh, in, he was talking about adrenaline-based activities and then acclimating the, the physical circumstance in, in, in order to prepare yourself for combat, basically. Stress inoculation. Stress inoculation. And he's like, and I, he was talking about that in the course, and he's like, who does this? And I was like, well, you know, I, I try to go out and I do really scary shit. I go whitewater kayaking and whitewater rafting. <laughs> Middle of the I woods. Climb, yeah, I yeah, climb I fucking mean, mountains. Yeah. I leave and intentionally go into the woods by myself because it's fucking dark and it's scary and you can only depend on yourself. Yeah. And I intentionally do things that are somewhat physically difficult and put myself into places where I might live or die because I think it's 
at that point, I was, you know, 22 years old trying to answer this question. I was like, well, this is, I didn't know necessarily why I was doing it. But then when he said it, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to push myself past fear. And I remember the first time I stepped out into the, the, the woods by myself for an extended stay. Uh, and it was, it was a long, hard trip. And it was actually, it was, it, you know, there's snow on the ground and it's fucking icy and I had snowshoes and I was a fucking train wreck, yeah. you know, trying you were, to get up. You were little too, weren't you? Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And that's the thing. Like your like, grandfather, didn't he? Oh, he used to drop me off all the time. Yeah. Like yeah. That. But, yeah. But really the... like by myself under like really hard conditions doing, cause I was getting, I was probably when I was 20 and I was, I was heading up into this really, a pretty nasty place in the Solway wilderness area in the winter. And I drove my Jeep out there and was like, all right, well, this is how much food I got. This is what I got. This is how many miles I, I got to do. And, uh, and that was kind of, I think, where I started that. But then it continued to develop. And one of the things that we used to talk about, or I used to talk about it all the time in, in uh, with GRS, mm -hmm. was that dudes would never confront each other. They would never confront each other and they would, they would never hit hit the hit guys straight on with a question and or a disappointment or anything i'm like but if you can't conquer the fear of your peers and or say to them what you feel is is where they're falling short or where you can give them an actual accolades to say you're doing fucking amazing yeah. if you have that fear that barrier how are you going to step out of a car and fucking get in a gunfight in the middle of the street with only one other guy that you can't even confront and tell him that you either love and respect him or you think that he needs to raise his game to a certain level. And uh, so I intentionally was very radically transparent with people to the point of which it was sometimes very detrimental because it was of the not, communication. Yeah, yeah, for your career and the way... The, the traditional aspect of that because of the posturing because of the sensitivity towards that because of that mythical sense of hey, you, you're not respecting me that whole right. nonsense it, it you know it made very difficult for you yeah i mean there are times i mean it was definitely a lightning rod of of sorts uh because of of the things that I would tell people, and there was way better ways for me to do it. Like super, <laughs> I, I look back on it now. I'm I was like, gonna oh, see how if way we were gonna... <laughs> better ways. It was not. I could have done this a million times better in, in a better youth, way. I, youth. Yeah, youth, misspent youth. But I, I, but I am interested. Like I do want to hear your your side of that too. Well, the great challenge is, and, and Evan is the anomaly, right? And that's who I become fascinated with mostly in my life because, you know, you can you can study the bell curve for sure, and I think by studying the bell curve, you can hit a, a nice component of acceptance of what maybe your performance thresholds are with a minimal amount of work. But if you're fascinated, you're a truth seeker, and you really want to expand your capabilities, whether it's business, whether it's your personal life, whatever, man, you got to start checking out these people who live out here. So from an early, early age, you know, he was out in the woods. And from an early age, he was swinging an axe. And from an early age, you know, this is the life that you will be taught because this is the, this is the expectation of the people who – you know, are the greatest, most profound influence in your life, your grandfather, your father, right? So he was the anomaly with fear. Cause, but most people, we don't, they don't do it at all, right? And the craziest aspect of it is, you know, I, 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 you're wired. You are hard wired for fear. And the studies now coming out because we've got the 3D spec scanning and all the different neuroscience that we're just breaking through on. I, I'm saying me like I'm one of those geeks but I, I that's how fat like I, I geek out on this stuff now is they're they're saying man you're literally the the way our neuroplasticity works there's the because of the amygdalas and the way it functions and the way it can override your prefrontal cortex your limbic system man you know it's crazy and 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 when i first discovered this it was through a guy named charles morgan who was at yale who'd been studying you guys for 30 years in the sear program and it was, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it's like yeah they'd put the 
before all the wazoo shit, he was like, all right, let's put a, a BP monitor on an SF guy versus, you know, another dude. We're going to put him in hard cell, smacking the shit out of him. And these guys are operating at 150 beats per minute. Their palms aren't sweaty. Their, their mouth isn't dry. You know, they're, they're able to answer not only those questions, but they're giving them like crossword puzzles to solve at the same team to see if they can shift sporadically and readjust kind of their problem solving capabilities. Whereas, you know, the, the other guy, the ground pounder over here is at 192. They can't think straight. They can't. So they're like, holy shit, what's going on there in the brain? It's like they did that cold water testing with, with Stu Smith. Bro. They put, they put him in a tub of water, filled it full of ice. And they're like, all right, this, you know, most people you'll be able to, like, they wanted to get out and, like, do some stress tests, yeah. shoot some pistols. And um, they put Stu in there. And, uh, like, seven minutes later, they're like, okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and pull you out now because this isn't working. Your temperature is staying the same and it's not affecting you. Stu is a remarkable human being and is a brilliant person on this stuff. If you haven't ever checked him out, I, I highly recommend you checking it out. So the, the reality that comes out of that is we're wired for fear. It's not going anywhere. And I've, I've gone through as many case studies as I find to try and find that person who isn't, right? Whether it's psychopathic behavior, sociopathic, whatever it is. And I found like this one case study of this chick that Harvard had done back in the 50s who her amygdalas were underdeveloped. And so you could put like a full grown male cat in front, you know, lion in front right. of her. She'd be like, hi, kitty, you know? <laughs> you like, what? <laughs> that is shit where everybody else is like, ah, right? But we have it. It's not going anywhere, right? And you also, you're taught fear your whole life, yeah. right? Think of what we teach our children, right? Yeah. My, my girls have memorized uh, 16 rules so far. And we, every time something poignant comes up, right? And there's seven in, in uh, my, my children are seven and five. And my other two are 10 and six from my girlfriend. But, and I've just started them memorizing the rule, but like rule number one, safety first. Rule number four, don't go near strangers. Hell, rule number 13 is embrace your fear, right? So we're conditioned, we're wired, we're conditioned but yet, along the way, the only way we get to learn how to embrace our fear is through experiential education, right? By Through the stress inoculation, by doing it. So now if you, you live in this protective, you know, uh, a bubble where you're not being challenged on how to manage the, those physiological reactions, uh, those psychological reactions, the, the emotional reactions on a regular reoccurring basis, and what happens? You have uh, uh, the need for a lot of safe, safe spaces, right? So within that, and Evan's 100%, so every time he goes out into the woods in that extreme environment and succeeds, what happens to his self-confidence? Goes up. Goes up exponentially. And, and what else? He has a de detailed anchor point of what that looks like, right? A cognitive reference point to what that looks like. Because the experience is not just, oh, you did well in school, pat on the back, or, hey, way to play on the soccer team. You guys didn't win a game. No one scored a goal. But here's a beautiful trophy for you. Right. How is that? anchored to the physical, mental, and the spiritual all connected, man, to really drive home that self-confidence. So that becomes the challenge, right, is to coalesce those the evolution together. But I, I firmly believe that if you don't have a real solid understanding of, on what's making you afraid, because how many people, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I ask this question, all right, who in here is afraid of, you know, spiders, right? Right. And, you know, Right. 200 hands yeah. go up. Well, you know, why? And because they'll kill you. And I go, do you know how many spider deaths there are? You're about six. And five of them are in Australia, right? right. What about uh, what about public speaking? Who's afraid of that? Everybody's friggin'. Yeah. So I'll bring somebody up on stage with me in front of everybody. And I'll, and I'll say, and you see them, they're like, holy shit. They turn white. They're like, they're a mess. Then I turn them around. I face me. I put the mic in their phone. And I say, tell me about your family. Tell me about, and then someone will pop up and they'll say, tell me the details. How tall are they? How this? Tell me what makes you laugh about them. And you see it just changes in them. And then they start, you know, because they get that emotional anchor and that, that peacefulness and boom, it's over. But what are the real fears? I mean, what are the ones that you really got to work on? I mean, am I going to screw up my children? Am I going to mess up my relationship? Am I going to fail in this business that how many people are counting on me, right? But nobody's doing the exercise, man. And it's it's a shame. It's a real shame. It's it's interesting. I have uh, when I was 
so I'm 43 when I was 12. I got thrown off a horse at my family's farm. Uh, and got back on the horse, rode him back to the barn. Pivotal I've ne- age. I've never been on one since. September the 6th, I start a six-day elk hunt in the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. And we are on a horse into that for 24 miles. So it's like, okay, I have no other option. Immersion. But to deal with this. Because, yeah. I mean, like, I told the guy, I was like, well, it's like, maybe I could come to Alien and hiking. And he goes, oh, it's 24 miles, and uh, you're going to have to ride a horse. I was like, all right, cool, man. That's fine. Well, I'll do it. What I love about you, though, is just in the five seconds we've met each other, yeah. you, you have an analytical process that's working in hyperdrive, right? And I love that about you. You seem like you have an intense, logical perspective, right? Yeah, sometimes. What, so, sometimes, right? 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 When, when, when it when it goes beyond and kind right. of re- it gets out of control. I'm, right. I, my brain thinks very similar to yours. And, but so what the conditioning, and I do this with athletes. I've worked with UFC fighters. I work with tennis players. I work with the Boston Red Sox right now. I've worked with the Miami Dolphins and, and everybody's like, Oh, what do you beat them? You, you put them in water and you make them carry logs. And no, that's, it doesn't, I, it's a hoo that's fun to attest, but that's not how I work, right? right. It's, that is not for everybody, right? right? But one of the things that I, I, I do is, is this conditioning, right? And it's, it's through that stress inoculation. So if I were you, I mean, you don't have much time now. Hell, man, I'd go just get on a horse for 10 minutes, you know, and then ride it around a, a thing for 20 minutes and ride around it for 30 minutes. And that way... You know, by the time you hit it, you haven't done any real immersion right. training, real, but you have a reference point of your fear saying, wow, hey, I, I can do this, I can do that. And so it'll, it'll drop your, the other stuff way down. So what I did, um, the way I operate is, you know, I tend to do a lot of things last minute because when there's a deadline, the, the wheels, you have, you have to perform. Yeah. I function better that way. So, I called the outfitter I'm going with, and I said, hey, man, do you have any other slots? He goes, I got two spots left. I said, all right, I'm going to take them both. So I called a bunch of my friends. I was like, hey, man, um, what are you doing this? I'm busy. I can't do it. I found one of my buddies, one of my best friends that uh, hunt with, hunted with in Africa a few times. Uh, we go past two years together. I said, Jamie, I want you to come on this elk hunt with me. He was like, hell yeah, man. What's the deal? I was like, dude, Selway Bitterroot, 24 miles on horseback. He goes, I'm in. Where do I send the check? And then he goes, hold on a second. You're terrified of horses. I said, that's why you're coming. Yeah, awesome. Because, and here's why. How, One, let me ask you a real quick, and I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you, right. but it's in my head. Do you love this guy? Yeah, he's like a brother. I refuse to fail in front of him. So think about the power of that, right, which we often don't do. What happens when our fear is big? We get shameful in it, right? right. right. We, we compartmentalize it. We, we, like if we're messing up at work, right? Yeah. You, you see people won't tell anybody. They'll cower. They'll try and cover it up and tell the absolute or people that are mismanaging their home finances and they just right. they don't tell it. It just builds and builds and builds and then all of a sudden it caves in instead of the the you know the counterintuitive thing is to which we learn in the soft community because it's essential the existential reality of your death is permanent at all specific time and place right, right. so if if you're going to shortchange me on your truth man you're going to get me killed and that ain't right. cool so what i'm doing is i'm combining two fears to solve the problem of one terrified of horses if i'm there in camp with four or five six strangers the way I would perceive it, oh, fuck these guys, I'll never see them again, I don't care, whatever. But if my best friend's there, I refuse to fail in front of someone or let someone down or have them their opinion of me change. Oh, shit, we canceled the hunt, Baker won't get on a horse. So that's never going to happen. So I'm combining two fears to solve one. Well, I, I like the operant mindset. I mean, I love negative positive. It's, it, it's a wonderful way to work with, with yourself in particular because it works, especially for guys like us. But I'm, I'm, man, I'm full blown fan of positive, positive, man. And, you know, and so, you know, what I would say is, you know, if you're in that space and it does provoke you, have him give him a little sign that say, hey, man, you know, just to touch you when he sees it on you. And that's your reset point for going, 
oh wow, it's it's presenting itself externally. Safety word. Yeah, yeah bro. Now you're talking yeah. about it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, 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 it's, it's also Red Sparrow. It, Red Sparrow. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Also, like when I, so I'm an avid hunter. I, I hunt a lot, and like I go out in the woods and wilderness and you know, up and down mountains and stuff. And it's like being friends with guys like Evan and Matt and Todd, you yeah. know, Andy Stump, things like that. It's you can't like, really be friends with Andy, though. He's too exceptional. He's a he curmudgeon. Is. Yeah. <laughs> he's just like... You have to kind of like just be fringe friends, I think. Yeah. yeah. But yeah I, that's, a, that's a good way of describing it's it. It's interesting. Like, I, I, I respect and admire what he does. And if I get next to him, it's really cool. It oozes yeah. off yeah, a little bit. Like maybe it'll just like shower on <laughs> like I've met, I We had him on his show once. And that's the only my only engagement with him. But like afterward, like I stood up straighter. Yeah. I was like, man, dude. Shoulders pinned back. <laughs> I was like... Damn, man, but, I feel good. But guys like that have an effect on me, even when they're 3,000 miles, 2,000 miles away from me. Uh -huh. Because what I do is like, if I'm, you know, all right, I got to get to that peak, there's an elk over there or whatever, and I'm tired, and it's like, okay, the right move on this animal is to go back down around two miles and come in on that side because the sun's setting or the sun's coming up and it's, the thermals are kicking up and mm -hmm. the wind's shifting. Or I'm tired, I can be a lazy piece of shit and just, go beeline it to him 400 yards and maybe that'll work. That's not going to work. And what I do, no, if, no offense to you, Evan, or any of you guys, it's like, if those some bitches can accomplish all the stuff that they have, I know that I could. So like you, you may not know this, are like a constant gnat oh, in my yeah. life. Like, it's like, don't let Evan down. Don't let Todd down. Do it the right way. What would they do if they were here? Okay, I'm going to do what they would do, but I'm going to do it better than them. Well, and that goes back to you know, we talk about it all the time. Who do you want to surround yourself with in your business? And who are you going to be a partner with? Are you going to be a, a, a partner with a person that has the capacity to embrace fear, has great self-confidence, can rebound back, is genuine, is honest, has a, has a strong emotional connection with you, and, and it doesn't bring too much ego into it? I mean, that's how making these tough choices, I think, in business – what messes people are in such a rush to jump in, get to the market as fast as possible, and they don't really think about it a little bit. They don't position themselves in the right capacity. They don't understand the market well enough, and they just go balls to the wall, and then they fail. Right. Two weeks ago, before I moved here, I was sitting in Evan's office, and we were talking about standing up another podcast. And Evan said, you ever heard the two-third, one-third rule? I was like, no. He goes, two-thirds is planning. One third is execution. And if you spend the time to plan things out, executing them is easy. And I was like, that's pretty heavy. I'm going to write that down. Well, I think that's a, it's a common thing for a lot of military guys. And uh, the fortunate thing that I've had is just being able to digest some of these things intellectually and, and emotionally and be able to say, okay, you know, where have I failed? Where have I succeeded? It be it, it, to have an honest conversation with yourself and, I've had more than enough uh, uh, opportunity to have really honest conversations with myself. You know, so for me, you know, it, ego and a lot of this stuff where, you know, I, the, the freedom of what my background has actually provided me is fucking incredible. It, it's the greatest MBA you could ever imagine, I, mm -hmm. I believe. I, and, and, I, and I think you nailed it. As long as you can have an honest discussion mm -hmm. with yourself. Right? And a lot of people won't do that. I think there's a lot of guys from our community, uh, you know, because they, they haven't, maybe they haven't been beaten down. Maybe they haven't really had some, some relatively big mistakes or whatever it might be. But those big mistakes, you, you, you can define who you are and how you actually uh, triumph over tragedy in a lot of these things. And I think, you know, I, I, I've, I've been really, really fortunate to just, you know, one, if you as a man, if you go out and you accomplish something like, you know, you get something like a, a, a green hat that says that you're really tough. Um, <laughs> you, Which you I can, love, by the way. Yeah, and, but you can, you can take that and say, okay, well, I, I, don't, I don't need to go do a bunch of other stuff to prove that I'm actually a really tough man, man guy. You know, I don't, I don't need to do that. I used to have this, 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 uh, this, this conversation a lot with people, and people were like, well... Because I was, I was talking about, I was, I was baking scones or something in my house in uh, Colorado. I love that you bake scones. <laughs> and, uh, I love and my story. buddy was like, "Does that like not mess with you? You know, like, like, 
like like emotionally like you, you know you're baking scones i'm like no man I'm, i want to learn how to bake a scone because i'm like super into it i love scones i'm gonna learn how to fucking bake them and he's like yeah but is, is it like does it like mess with you you know like you're a dude and i'm like no man like I, i'm and, and I, was, I was a green beret i was like yeah. no man i'm a green beret like i could be you know baking scones in a fucking dress wearing high heels and sucking a dick i don't fucking give two shits <laughs> Like it doesn't fucking doesn't bother me whatsoever. I don't give a shit. He was like getting into like green berets and, should not be baking scones. Like I, I I'm I'm totally fine with, with who good. I am, man. I, I want to learn how to bake a fucking scone. If I if I want to learn how to do something, I'm not gonna be like, oh well, I can't do that because I'm a man. And, and, like, then what, just, and then what happens? You bake that scone and you turn it into a multi million dollar co company, right? Yeah. So you know what's more masculine than that? Well, my, so my, suck on that, buddy. My, my, I, I think my first <laughs> I think my first pan of scones actually turned out like one big giant mushy fucking cookie. But uh, other than that, but I kept going, and I don't think I ever made a really good scone. But the the whole thing in that was like that freedom and the context Jeez. that allowed me to do whatever I've done post that. And I have friends now and I'm sure you do, which, you know, they're, I'm 41 years old and I talk to my buddies from high school and they're in their forties now. And they are going through other psychological issues that I don't have. And I will never have those like, Oh man, I should have done this and I should have done that. And I'm like, remember when we were, you know, and I was, I was having this conversation with one of my friends. I was like, remember when we were in college and you know, and, and we were in high school together, we were in junior high and we were in elementary school together. So we had gone through life basically at that point, yeah. but I had completely changed. So, you know, I'd gone off and I'd joined the army and I'd come back and I said to the hell with society, right? I'm going to do whatever it is that Evan does and I'm just going to do exactly what it is that will make me happy. It will, will put fulfillment in my belly every day. That's so awesome. And I, I, I opted out of all of it. You know, I, I, I wasn't like, you know, the, the fraternity party dude or anything. I was like, you know, running a hundred miles a week and fucking wearing like, really just random bullshit because I wasn't interested in clothing. I wasn't interested in this. Only thing I was interested in was trying to push myself. Truth. That was it. Truth. Truth. And those guys back then, and it is, it, and it's not me. I'm not bad. I'm not bad mouthing those guys or anything, but those guys looked Different at me. Paths. They looked at me and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, this is like, and I remember this conversation so well. I was talking to somebody. I was like, "I'm going to go. I'm going to go be a uh, Green Beret and and eventually join the CIA or whatever fucking age it was." You know, and yeah. they're like, "Dude, no way. You're not going to. You're never going to make it. That. You're never going to make that yeah. or whatever." Or don't you want to get like, married and yeah, get a job? Yeah, dude, you're and, you're going to miss yeah. out on the greatest time in your life. That's what one of those dudes said. He's like, "You're going to miss out on the greatest time of your life, college, like drinking and fucking banging out randos and like, I'm like." <laughs> Dude, if this is the greatest part of my life, I'm wrong. fucked. <laughs> like, is this like, like I'm not even an adult, man? I got a ton of shit that I want to do, and it, none of this exists yeah. in this fucking world. Like, yeah. I have a ton of stuff that I'm interested in seeing, you know, and and none of it has to do with like how many fucking beers I can drink against some other fucking, you know, some yeah. other dude in the in the basement of a frat house. Like, that doesn't. I I don't want to be a beer pong player, man. Like, yeah. I want to be able to fucking. I want to go see shit that will be DNA changing. changing code. You are yeah. I want to. I want to rewrite my fucking code. Rewriting this is code. life. Yep. I do. I wasn't even thinking about it in this context, and it's only been the last couple of years where I've really been able to kind of wrap my mind around it. the The world is so. Uh, I should say that the 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 universe, the galaxy, the 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 Earth, and time. It's so infinite. And, and being able to put yourself into perspective in a way that says, I am nothing, but this is all I have, right? I am nothing, but this is, this is it. My reality and what I do right now on this earth matters. Actually, every second matters. Every second. Every fucking second. Because I don't know exactly what's going to happen on this, the, the next adventure that this, that, that my soul will take. Yeah. I don't know. No, you, you hope, 
I mean, I hope. I hope, but you don't know. You hope. You hope. You, know, you pray. You, 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 you keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. You know, you prepare. Yeah. You live a good life. But I'll tell you what, the, the sponge of life, like, that thing isn't going to be left on the counter full of fucking full of water, dude. I'm going to wring every last drop out of it. I'm going to put it in the fucking oven. I'm going to burn that thing to a fucking crisp, shake it off. Like, everything I can get out of this, like, I'm going to get it all. And I think for me, there's a, there's a differentiating factor psychologically for a lot of guys when you're talking to like dudes that haven't lived like that. Thank you for listening to Launch Code. This concludes part one of three of our conversation with David Rutherford.